morning. Good morning. We're going to start this morning our worship service with 593. We shall assemble on the mountains. We shall assemble at the throne with humble hearts and this beautiful, beautiful Sunday morning. It's so good to be together and to see this fine number today and, and uh, in, in, the, in the fellowship hall and also if you're joining us outside or uh, live streaming or we'll be watching later today. It's always just good to be together as a family. We have several visitors this morning and we welcome you, your honored guests, and uh, we welcome you back at any time uh, to please return at every opportunity. I'm going to repeat some good news we, we had in the bulletin this week. Uh, first of all, we're really glad that Shea Kofer did well in his surgery. He has a pretty long uh, uh, involved recuperation ahead, but we look forward to his full recovery. We're also really happy to uh, welcome two new girls to this family, uh, Oma, uh, Oma Jane Cochran and Brianna Rios. It's two pretty names. Uh, two pretty girls, I'm sure. We're, we're happy that Rachel and John's health conditions have improved, and we're glad that Gina Rios is doing well. Also, uh, Rachel Bible has some good news, uh, maybe not for her folks, but she's accepted a job with Harding University in Athens, Greece, uh, beginning this summer. And as a result, she will not be uh, participating in the Dry Bones ministry this summer, and uh, Sonia tells me that if you've contributed already to that effort, that money will be refunded to you. There are a number of relatives or friends in the congregation who are mentioned in the bulletin as sick, and we would ask you to please continue to remember them in your prayers and, and provide them help as needed. Deacons, please remember there's an elder deacon meeting at 3 o'clock next Sunday at 3 o'clock. I said that twice. Next Sunday at 3 o'clock, 
uh, in, here in the, in the fellowship hall. Uh, so, so please, uh, we will send you an agenda uh, before that meeting occurs. Always remember, too, that the elders will be at the building at 3 o'clock this afternoon should you need prayers or have concerns or discuss any need that you have. Are there any other announcements that I've missed? Let's go to God in prayer. Our blessed Father in heaven, we praise and we glorify your name as our creator and keeper. Father, we thank you for all the blessings you just shower on us continually. We're most thankful that we can assemble in your presence this morning and to love and encourage each other. And we pray to increasingly grow in your grace. Continue to bless this congregation, Father. We pray you will guide us and use us more effectively to carry on your mission. And each one of us will be a light in the growing darkness around us. Father, without your love, we're completely lost. We are all sinners, yet while we are all sinners, you showed your love to us by sending your precious and perfect Son to us. And he shed his sacrificial blood to cover us completely from your deserved wrath. He's the perfect sacrifice that washes us continually. And we are forever grateful for that. Help us, Father, to walk closer to you in each day. And we also pray, Father, you'll make us stronger in your spirit as we worship together now. Through Jesus we pray. Amen. Number 173. 173. Sing hallelujah to the Lord. Sing hallelujah to the Lord. Number 257, 257.
Prepare our minds for the Lord's Supper. We'll sing number 134. 134. Your only son knows sin to hide, but you have sent him from your side to walk upon this guilty side and to become the Lamb of God. Your gift of As we consider the collection, would you bow with me? Our Father God, we come into your presence grateful for the way you shower gifts upon us, the way that you love us. Uh, you love us in ways we can't even see. And I just look forward to the moments where we can see them. And right now, dear Father, I just pray that as we consider what you're doing through this congregation, what you've given us and what we try to give back to you and give back to this community and this world, dear Father, I just pray that your blessings would be with us. I know they always are, but I just help, ask that you help us to remember them right now. We seek uh, your glory right now. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Last Thursday, I got out of school at 3 o'clock, and Keenan and I jumped in the car. We're going to go up to see uh, my father in Virginia. Haven't seen him for, I hadn't seen him for about 15 months, and it was just time to see my dad. You know, time is always moving. Time is always making things change, so I thought might, might as well go up there and try to see him while I can. Uh, as we drove, um, you know, the weather's been a little unpredictable, has it not? So as we drove, it was, it was pretty decent around here. We had decent weather, but, um, you know, we ran into like sub 30 degree weather and two snowstorms as we went up to Virginia. <laughs> and then uh, by Wednesday, it was almost 85 degrees. So it was such a, it was a big change. Um, Keenan and I went to a lacrosse game and we sat in 80 degree weather in the afternoon last week. We were at Roanoke College in Salem, Virginia. Some of you might remember that one of the proctors went to school there. We were watching the lacrosse game, and to the left of me was the entire girls' field hockey team, and they were watching the lacrosse game. And there was a senior there, and, um, and I could hear her talking about, you know, time is just changing and so much change and, you know, everything with the whole pandemic and all that kind of stuff. And she was just considering, like, what am I going to do for my work? And what am I going to do as far as relationships? And she was like, there was a, a, a defensive player. She's like, oh, I'd just love to marry him and move down to Houston with him. And everything would be perfect. But that's not going to happen. She was, like, all frustrated about it. 
And then she was trying to figure out, well, I guess I'm just going to go back to Connecticut. And she just was like going through this. And she was talking about her boyfriend. And she, I heard her say these words, we just need to have a come to Jesus meeting. And I, I just thought to myself, like, obviously, uh, by virtue of her language, she probably was not a follower. And if, if she were, I, you know, I just sort of feel bad for her because she's just very crude in the way she spoke. But I just thought to myself how funny it is that, that we all need that. We, and even... I'm not picking on her, but even the heathen knows we need to have a come to Jesus meeting. So right now, uh, we're going to have a come to Jesus meeting, a, a time where we just listen to Jesus. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And, and I just thought that's what I want to do is just have a come to Jesus meeting because sometimes we all feel disoriented. Things are always changing. The weather's changing. I look in the mirror and I'm changing. I'm thinking about the future and I can see the change. And then I just realize I need to come to Jesus meeting. So can we just do that right now? As we are suffering through the time of disorientation, the time of struggle, the time of swift transition, can we just listen to the words of Jesus? I'm in John chapter 17. Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son that the son may glorify you. Since you have given him authority over all flesh to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. Praise God for that, right? And this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ who you, who you have sent. I glorified you on earth. Praise God for that, right? Isn't that amazing? He did it. He did it. He did it. I'm so grateful for him. Having accomplished the work that you gave me to do, and now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. I have manifested your name to the people whom you gave me out of the world. Yours they were, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they know that everything that you have given me is from you. For I have given them the words that you gave me, and they have received them and have come to know in truth that I came from you. And they have believed that you sent me. I'm praying for them. I'm not praying for the world, but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours. All mine are yours, yours are mine, and I am glorified in them. I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world, and I'm coming to you. Holy Father, keep them in your name, which you have given me, that they may be one, even as we are one. While I was with them, I kept them in your name, which you have given to me. I have guarded them, and not one of them has been lost except the son of destruction, that the scripture might be fulfilled. But now I am coming to you, and these things I speak in the world, that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them your word, and the word, ha excuse me, I have given them your word, and the world has hated them, because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I'm not of the world. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. As you have sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. And for their sake, I consecrate myself, that they also may be sanctified in truth. I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word that they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory that you have given me, I give to them, that they may be one even as we are one, I in them, you in me, that they may become perfectly one, so that the world may know that you have sent me and love them even as you love me. Father, I desire that they also, whom you have given me, may be with me where I am, to see my glory that you have given me because you loved me before the foundation of the world. O righteous Father, even though the world does not know you, I know you, and these know that you have sent me. I made known to them your name, and I will continue to make it known that the love with which you have loved me may be in them and I in them. I'm going to go up to the tail end of verse, um, chapter 16 for just a couple, couple verses. Jesus says, I have said these things to you, that in me you may have peace. 
In the world, you will have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Brothers and sisters, I want to remind you that Jesus prayed this prayer for you and me. I want to remind you that we are disoriented on this earth. We are traveling through series of tribulations, through things that we're just like, what do we do next? Jesus has overcome the world. He's overcome sin. He's overcome death. Praise God, right? I mean, aren't you? I mean, I just listened to that girl, and I wish that, I, you know, that, I mean, she was sort of in the context of her whole team, so I didn't know how to be like, don't worry about it. Jesus got you. Remember your own words. Come to Jesus. Have a meeting with him. Aren't you so glad that we have this, this space and time every week where we can have a come to Jesus meeting and be like, man, it's good. It's good. We are good. Do you feel it? I feel it. I feel it. I don't know if you feel it. God is good and he is taking care of us. Can we give thanks for the bread? Father, as I come into your presence and I take this little cracker, this little foamy piece of bread, I try not to focus on it, but I try to focus on Jesus who has overcome the world. I am trying to focus on the fact that I don't have to worry. I don't have to worry about what's happening here in this congregation, what's happening in this community. I don't have to worry about the world. I don't have to worry about the drama, but I can just rest in you because he has fulfilled every commandment. He has taken care of that peace that, that everybody's looking for. And I'm trying to meet him at the point where he has been obedient to you so that you will accept me. And I pray that you'll do that for us all here. I pray that the unbelievers in this room will have a come to Jesus meeting where they will just praise you and fall at his knees and realize that he ushers in peace. He usher, ushers in a time where the world does not have to shake us up, that we don't have to be worried and disoriented. I'm grateful for um, the tribulations that do come because we realize that Jesus has defeated them all. And I'm grateful that we can celebrate that right now. So we give thanks for this bread for the one who has defeated all tribulation. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. I'm going to give thanks for the cup. Our Father God, as I come into your presence, uh, I'm a little shaky. Because I know who I am, I know what I am, I know where I am in relation to you, and you are holy, you are beyond anything that this flesh can really understand or comprehend, and I realize that without the shedding of blood, I cannot come into your presence. I'm trying to be humble, I'm trying to understand my relationship to you, my relationship to Christ, and I'm trying to bow before you, and I just pray that we would every time we take this cup, so that we would examine ourselves, we know what we are, and we know that we need to be covered. We need to be covered so that that life can be extended to us through the precious sacrifice that Jesus made for us. I'm grateful for that sacrifice and I praise you for it. I praise Jesus for it. I'm grateful for what he did. And we take this cup in remembrance of him. In Jesus' name, amen. Number 281, 281.
Number 260. 260. Oh, worship the Song books will, new, will mark number 426 will be the song after Greg's lesson. 426. Morning, church. This morning's reading will be from 1 Samuel chapter 15. We will read verses 1 through 23. <clears throat> Samuel also said to Saul, the Lord sent me to anoint you king over his people, over Israel. Now therefore heed the voice of the words of the Lord. Thus says the Lord of hosts, I will punish Amalek for what he did to Israel, how he ambushed him on the way when he came up from Egypt. Now go and attack Amalek and utterly destroy all that they have and do not spare them, but kill both man and woman, infant and nursing child, ox and sheep, camel and donkey. So Saul gathered the people together and numbered them in Telam, 200,000 foot soldiers and 10,000 men of Judah. And Saul came to a city of Amalek and lay in wait in the valley. Then Saul said to the Kenites, Go, depart, get down from among the Am Amalekites, lest I destroy you with them. For you showed kindness to all the children of Israel when they came up out of Egypt. So the Kenites departed from among the Amalekites. And Saul attacked the Amalekites from Havilah all the way to Shur, which is east of Egypt. He also took Agag, king of the Amalekites, alive and utterly destroyed all of the people with the edge of the sword. But Saul and the people spared Agag and the best of the sheep, and the oxen, the fatlings and the lambs and all that was good and were unwilling to utterly destroy them. But everything despised and worthless that they utterly destroyed, that they utterly destroyed, excuse me. Now the word of the Lord came to Samuel, saying, I greatly regret that I have set up Saul as king, for he has turned back from following me and has not performed my commandments. And it grieved Samuel, and he cried out to the Lord all night. So when Samuel rose early in the morning to meet Saul, it was told Samuel, saying, Saul went to Carmel, and indeed he set up a monument for himself, and he has gone on around, passed by, and gone down to Gilgal. Then Samuel went to Saul, and Saul said to him, Blessed are you of the Lord. I have performed the commandment of the Lord. But Samuel said, What then is this bleeding of the sheep in my ears and the lowing of the oxen which I hear? And Saul said, They have brought them from the Amalekites, for the people spared the best of the sheep and the oxen to sacrifice to the Lord your God, and the rest we have utterly destroyed. Then Samuel said to Saul, Be quiet, 
and I will tell you what the Lord said to me last night. And he said to him, speak on. So Samuel said, when you were little in your own eyes, were you not head of the tribes of Israel? And did, you, and did not the Lord anoint you king over Israel? Now the Lord sent you on a mission and said, Go and utterly destroy the sinners, the Amalekites, and fight against them until they are consumed. Why then did you not obey the voice of the Lord? Why did you swoop down on the spoil and do evil in the sight of the Lord? And Saul said to Samuel, but I have obeyed the voice of the Lord and gone on the mission on which the Lord sent me and brought back Agag, king of Amalek. I have utterly destroyed the Amalekites. But the people took of the plunder, sheep and oxen, the best of the things which should have been utterly destroyed to sacrifice to the Lord your God in Gilgal. So Samuel said, Has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to heed than the fat of rams. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry, because you have rejected the word of the Lord. He has also rejected you from eating king. Have we not all sinned and rejected the word of the Lord and not obeyed his commandments at some point in our lives? I know I have. And this passage reminds me of that, and it makes me sorrowful for it. But I am so thankful for Jesus and for his sacrifice. And Kendall, thank you for your words this morning. Let's go to God in prayer. Uh, Father, we just see your strong rebuke of Saul here through Samuel. And Father, I just, I just praise you in that your word is a sharp sword and that it, it rebukes us. And... Uh, and that you still love us anyway. Just thank you for the gift of your son, and thank you for our church, and for all the many mercies and blessings you bestow on us each and every day. Father, we just humbly come before you this morning, and I just pray that you would just please uh, pierce our hearts and guide us in all that we do, and please forgive us of our shortcomings, and help us to obey you in everything. It's in Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Good morning, Signal Mountain. <clears throat> wow. It is great to see you all. You know, sometimes I get up here and I, uh, I look out and I don't even hardly see you. Isn't that sad? Because I'm thinking about what I'm going to say. Thank you, Will, for that prayer and for the reading. Danny, for the songs. And uh, thank you all for coming. Kendall, thanks for those words. Very needful and encouraging. I believe that God loves Saul. I just don't believe that Saul loved God. That's the problem. Uh, and I know that after this, after Samuel's words to Saul from God, he gave Saul years of time and opportunity to repent. Didn't he? I mean, he didn't kill him right there. You did it, you're dead. He gave him year after year after year after year of opportunity and continued to warn him and continued to show him. Saul let it go. But what did Saul do? No, I will have it. That's really kind of the tragedy of Saul. When God rebuked David for his sin, David was ready to die. He knew and he received that rebuke with humility and repentance. Saul receives the rebuke with excuses and grasping for power. What do you think about this reading from 1 Samuel 15? I mean, there's a lot of hard stuff in here, right? Welcome to 1 Samuel. If you have been reading with us, uh, this week we read through most of the last half of the book of 1 Samuel here in the Bible. Last week was Easter, and we looked at Jesus, the kinsman redeemer, 
and saw how he came here to save us. And that's exactly why we're here. We're here because Christ has called us and saved us and given us hope in him. But while we're walking with God, we often need rebuke and correction. Can I get an amen? Why do we need those rebukes and corrections? Because we stumble, don't we? Jesus said, those I love, I rebuke and chasten everyone I received as a son. God loves you, that's why he corrects you. How do we receive correction? Saul didn't receive it too good. Too well. Um, we're back in 1 Samuel this week, and I pray that Lord, the Lord will open our hearts, open our eyes to his word, help us hear his voice, and learn the lesson of obedience so that we can enjoy his goodness and his glory, and the lesson of humility and repentance so that we can be restored over and over again. Keith Green wrote a song that was inspired by these words in 1 Samuel 15. And it's a strong message to the church. Listen to what he wrote. To obey is better than sacrifice. I don't need your money. I want your life. I hear you say that I'm coming back soon, but you act like I'll never return. Well, you speak of grace and my love so sweet, how you thrive on milk but reject my meat. And I can't help weep, weeping of how it will be if you keep on ignoring my words. Well, you pray to prosper and succeed, but your flesh is something I just can't feed. To obey is better than sacrifice. I want more than Sunday and Wednesday nights. Because if you can't come to me every day, then don't bother coming at all. To obey is better than sacrifice. I want hearts of fire, not your prayers of ice. And I'm coming back quickly to give to you according to what you have done. According to what you have done. Is that an admonition song or what? I need that. I need God's loving, gracious, joyful blessings of just enjoying his gifts. And I need him to say, Greg, smarten up. I need it all. And he's a father who loves so much, he gives it all. Not just half. You know, we're studying as we go through the Bible. What are there two points that we're looking at? Do you remember? Do you remember where they are? God's what? Grace and God's wrath. Okay? I need to know the God of grace, and I also need to know the God of wrath, because it's the same God. And I need to understand how that works so that I will draw closer to him. And walk with them. Don't you? I need that. And churches today tend to tip the scale one side or the other. It's all about His wrath or it's all about His grace. And the Word of God doesn't do that. Doesn't do it. We see in the Word of God the awesome, amazing grace of God. And we also see the terrible wrath of God. And it's important for us to Know what it is to love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. That's the first command. But we also need to know what it is to fear our God and to revere and respect Him. Because whatever you love is going to run your life. And whatever you fear is also going to control you. So give your love to God and give your fear to God and He will keep you and bring you to ultimate glory. Okay, 1 Samuel gives us a lot about these things and gives us lots of examples. The whole book of 1 Samuel is really a book that revolves around three pairs. Three pairs. In each case, there is a reversal of fortune. The lowly rises and the powerful falls. That's the three examples we have in 
1 Samuel. The first example is very short. It's about two women. One is named Hannah, the other is Penina. And they're two wives of the same man, Elkanah. Now there's your first problem, right? We aren't told anything about how Elkanah married these two women, but that sets up our example. And let's pick up, if you have your Bibles, open to 1 Samuel 1. We're going to look at verses 1 through 8. 1 Samuel chapter 1, let's hear from God's own word. 1 Samuel 1, 1 through 8. Now there was a certain man of Ramathaim, a Zophite. I don't know what a Zophite is, but it's right there. In the hill country of Ephraim, whose name was Elkanah, son of Jehoram, or Joram, the son of Elihu, the son of Tohu, the son of Zuth, and Ephraim. Wow, there's his ancestry right there. Verse 2, he had two wives. Don't know how. One was called Hannah, the other Panina. Panina had children, but Hannah had none. And that reminds me of this little piggy went to market. This little piggy stayed home. This little piggy had roast beef. This little piggy had none, right? Hannah has no children. Panina has children. Year after year, this man went up from his town to worship and sacrifice to the Lord Almighty at Shiloh, where Hophni and Phinehas, the two sons of Eli, were priests of the Lord. Whenever the day came for Elkanah to sacrifice, he would give portions of meat to his wife Panina and to all her sons and daughters. But to Hannah, he gave a double portion because he loved her and the Lord had closed her womb. Who is responsible for Hannah's condition, according to this verse? The Lord has closed her womb. And because the Lord had closed her womb, he says it twice, her rival, Panina, did what? Took the opportunity, right? Kept provoking her in order to irritate her. What do you think about people like that? You know anybody like that? Any of you kids have a brother or sister that does that to you sometimes? This went on year after year. Every time they go up to worship to do this, whenever Hannah went up to the house of the Lord, her rival provoked, provoked her until she wept and would not eat. So she's there and she's just broken. She won't eat. And Elkanah, her husband, he meant well, but he didn't help at all. He would say, Hannah, why are you weeping? Why don't you eat? Why are you downhearted? Don't I mean more to you than 10 sons? Guys, we just don't know how to do it sometimes. Well, Hannah, in despair, goes before God to pray. And she prays for a son. And she promises God, God, if you'll give me a son, I'll give him back to you for the rest of his life. She goes to the house of God. Eli, the old priest, is watching and he sees her praying and her mouth is moving. But there's no words coming out. And he thinks she's drunk. And so he adds insult to injury by telling Hannah, stop drinking, put away your wine. Well, she explains and begs him not to consider her like a wicked woman. And so Eli quickly sees and he goes, go in peace and may God grant your request. Having heard those words, Hannah put her hope in God. She's encouraged and God grants her a son, Samuel. And she keeps her promise. She gives to God this son, Samuel. And God gives her three sons and two daughters. And she rejoices in a song that's recorded for us in chapter 2. Sounds somewhat like Mary's song. Got Samuel 2 there. Hannah prayed and said, my heart rejoices in the Lord. In the Lord, my horn is lifted high. My mouth boasts over my enemies, for I delight in your deliverance. There is no one holy like the Lord. There is no one besides you. There is no rock like our God. What she's done is she's been through hardship and God has blessed her, and she's recognizing it with praise and adoration to God. Now, I'm sure she's going to go through a few more of those, don't you? Know that's going to happen? But this is the kind of heart God looks for. The one who recognizes him 
and seeks him when they need and praises him in his blessings and just draws closer to him through it all. And she is blessed. The reversal of fortune happens. She is raised up and Penina is no longer mentioned even. The second pair, first is Hannah and Penina. The second pair are two men of God. One is Eli and one is Samuel. Eli is the high priest. He is the judge over Israel. He has a lot of power and authority. And he has two wicked sons, Hophni and Phinehas, who treat God and God's worshipers with contempt. They are wicked, and you can read about it. I won't go into it. But Eli talks to them, but he will not restrain them. He will not be a good father figure to his boys. He will not restrain his own sons. And listen to what happens. Samuel is there as a boy growing up in God's house with Eli. And as a child, God appears to Samuel. And God tells him what he's going to do to Eli and his sons how he's going to bring them down because of their disobedience. Pick up in chapter 3 with me, verse 11. The Lord is speaking to Samuel. It's nighttime. Samuel's already heard God's voice three times. He didn't know it was God. And Eli recognizes this is God. So you, you speak to him next time you hear him call you, Samuel. And you say, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. And so God speaks again. And Samuel says, speak, Lord, your servant is listening. And God gives Samuel this message. Verse 11 of chapter 3. The Lord said to Samuel, See, I'm about to do something in Israel that will make the ears of everyone who hears it tingle. At that time, I will carry out against Eli everything I spoke against his family from beginning to end. God's already sent a prophet to warn Eli about this, by the way. And Eli did not repent. He was not corrected by the word of God. And now he's going to pay. Verse 13. God said, I told him that I would judge his family forever because of the sin he knew about. His sons made themselves contemptible and he failed to restrain them. Therefore, I swore to the house of Eli, the guilt of Eli's house will, listen to this, never be atoned for by sacrifice or offering. Ooh. God's word is fulfilled in the next chapter. Eli has two sons, and they go out to war, and his two sons die in battle, and Eli dies the same day. The same day. The word is Ichabod. The glory's departed. So Samuel rises because God doesn't let a word of his fall short, and Eli falls. The powerful falls, the humble rises. And now the third pair. They make up the greatest part of the books of First and Second Samuel. And that is King Saul and later King David. But Saul and David. Saul's beginnings are told about in chapter 9. And I'm skimming to get you through this. But chapter 9, Saul is from an impressive family. And he himself is impressive in his height. He is head and shoulders taller than most of the men. And we meet Saul, and he's looking for a lost donkey. And that may be a foreshadowing of his own character. I don't know. But that causes him to be at a place where he seeks out Samuel. And when he gets there, Samuel's already ready for him. Samuel knows he's coming. And Saul meets Samuel. And Samuel anoints Saul as king over Israel. And God gives to Saul a powerful gift of his spirit. And Saul begins to prophesy. It's interesting. If you go with me to chapter 10, verses 9 through 13, we'll look at that. Chapter 10, beginning verse 9. He's been anointed, and he has received the things that he was supposed to, the, the, the word of Samuel came true exactly like Samuel said would happen. And verse 9 says, as Saul turned to leave Samuel, God changed Saul's heart. And all these signs were fulfilled that day. When they arrived at Gibeah, a procession of prophets met him. The Spirit of God came upon him in power and 
he joined in their prophesying. When all those who had formerly known him saw him prophesying with the prophets, they asked one another, what is this that's happened to the son of Kish? Is Saul also among the prophets? That's going to be said a few times along the way. A man who lived there answered, and who's their father? So it became a saying, is Saul also among the prophets? After Saul stopped prophesying, he went to the high place. Now, just that much. Samuel is now going to call together all the people of Israel, and he's going to give a speech as he installs Saul as their king. So we pick up in verse 17 of the same chapter, 10. Samuel summons the people of Israel to the Lord at Mizpah, and he says to them, This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. I brought you up out of Egypt, and I delivered you from the power of Egypt and from all the kingdoms that oppressed you. But you have now rejected your God, who saves you out of all your calamities and distresses. And you have said, no, set a king over us. So now present yourselves before the Lord by your tribes and clans. Doesn't sound like a real celebration of installation of a king, does it? Sounds more like a rebuke of God for rejecting him as king, does it not? Verse 30, Samuel brought all the tribes of Israel near, the tribe of Benjamin was chosen, then brought forward the tribe of Benjamin, clan by clan. Uh, Matri's clan was chosen. Finally, Saul, son of Kish, was chosen, but when they looked for him, he wasn't to be found. Saul's hiding. They inquired further from the Lord. Where is he? You know, where's the man? Has he come here yet? And the Lord said, yes, he's hidden among the baggage. <laughs> Saul, the tall Saul, is seeing himself in a small way, and he's hiding. He's shy. They find him, they bring him there, and the people see him head and shoulders taller than any of the others. And Samuel says to all the people, do you see the man the Lord has chosen? There's no one like him among the people. And the people shouted, long live the king. Samuel explained to the people the regulations of kingship, probably Deuteronomy 13, and he wrote them down on a scroll and deposited it before the Lord. And then Samuel dismissed the people, each to his own home. Saul goes to Gibeah, accompanied by some valiant men whose hearts God had touched. But some of the troublemakers said, how can this man save us? How can this fellow save us? And they despised him and brought him no gifts. But Saul kept silent. We find it the first part of Saul's inauguration and, and uh, being king that he shows humility. But it doesn't last. How does Saul do with his newly granted power? How does he do with that? First, he seems to do well, but not too much time passes, and Saul begins to stumble. And then we see what his newly found power does to Saul. His pride begins to grow, and his faith in God wanes. The major themes of Israel in Saul's day, or the major theme, the major enemies let me read it right. The major enemies of Israel in Saul's day were who? Do you know? The Philistines. In fact, the place is called Palestine. You know where that come from? That's Philistia. Uh, but if you say Palestine to the Jews over there today, they'll say, this is not Palestine. This is Israel. And they're correct. It's not Philistia. It's Israel. Anyway, the Philistines were hugely powerful. They were people who knew how to make iron weapons and chariots. And throughout Saul's day, they were a constant curse on Israel. They were one of the worst enemies they had. You look at chapter 13, verses 19 through 21, and you'll see they kept them from being able to have blacksmiths so that they couldn't make iron weapons. Upon fall, uh, Saul's first military encounter with these Philistines, are you staying with me okay? I know I'm, I'm hoping. I know I'm covering a lot here, but he encounters the Philistines, and Saul took matters into his own hands. Instead of waiting on Samuel to come and offer the sacrifice, which was Samuel's duty, Saul steps up and did it himself. He steps out of line. And as soon as he did, guess who showed up? Samuel shows up. The one who was supposed to offer. And Samuel speaks to him. Go to chapter 13, verse 13 with me. 1 Samuel 13, beginning verse 13. Samuel's words to him are, you acted foolishly. You have not kept the command the Lord your God gave you. Listen to these words. If you had, he's speaking to Saul, if you had kept the words of the Lord, he would have established your kingdom over Israel for all time. Is that true? Yes, it's true. 
He would have established your kingdom for all time. But now your kingdom will not endure. The Lord has sought out a man after his own heart and appointed him leader of his people. And he repeats again, because you have not kept the Lord's command. Saul, you don't get to do it your way. This is not a Burger King, Israel. Have it your way. You've got to do it God's way. It's God's way or not at all. You will see what happens. I just have to have an application message right quick. What happens when a country does it God's way? What happens? God gives it blessings, does he not? Will he still rebuke and chasten? Yes. But what happens when a country gives up on God and goes their own way? They fall. They fall. Just saying. Saul's son, Jonathan, shows greater faith in God and better leadership skills than his own father, Saul. Saul's folly comes out in chapter 14 when he is engaged with the Philistines and he wants to kill his own son, Jonathan, for eating a little honey when he cursed the people saying, fight and nobody touches any food, a curse on the man who eats anything until my enemies are dead, until I'm avenged of my enemies. Foolish choice. Jonathan didn't even know that oath or sworn thing had happened. He dipped a little honey on the stick and tasted it, and his eyes got brighter. He said, wow, this is good. And then they said, you shouldn't have done that. Your father put a curse on anybody who does that. That evening, as Saul's trying to get help from God, and he finds out God's not answering, he finds out, who did this? He's searching for who did this, who caused this. And Jonathan is selected. And you know what Saul wanted to do? Kill his own son. Jonathan says, I tasted a little honey. Am I to die now? And Saul says, he swore an oath again. I swear by God. Yes, you're going to die, Jonathan. The army rescues Jonathan, and Saul's oath goes unanswered and broken. Saul's good at giving oaths that aren't good. I'll let you read about that. Finally, we come to our reading passage in chapter 15. God tests Saul, and Saul fails the test. And God will choose another king for Israel, one who will follow God's will and lead God's people by obeying God's words rather than usurping God's authority and disobeying God's commands. Now again, here we are. In chapter 15, Saul could have shown humility. He could have accepted God's rebuke and discipline and said, I was wrong and I, I, I concede. I give up. God, I'm so sorry. I failed. That could have happened, but it didn't. When God told Saul that he would give, he had to give up his power as king, Saul grasped for it with a vengeance. The rest of the story of Saul is one of tragedy. God gave Saul opportunity after opportunity to repent and surrender to God's will, but no. Saul becomes a murderous maniac against God's chosen anointed replacement. And who is that? David, the man after God's own heart. I want to close with this. God's own heart. Hmm. What's in God's own heart? What's God's heart like? And how can you know? Do you know God's heart? Do you know God's heart? Jesus said, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden. I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart. And you shall find rest for your souls. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. Come to me. The call of God is a call to your heart to have his heart. And he will do what it takes to get you there if you'll give him yourself. Give him yourself. What is the greatest commandment? Love the Lord your God with what? All your heart. All your soul, all your mind, all your strength. But it starts with our hearts, doesn't it? It starts with our hearts. The tragedy of Saul is his heart. It's not God's love. It's not God's work. It's not God's grace that's missing. It's a heart 
that is failing to hear and heed God. What kind of heart do you have today? Where's your heart? Where's your heart? Did you know that God made you to be like him? <laughs> he created us in his own image and likeness. He made you to be able to have a heart like he has. And so David, after he sinned and failed miserably at one point in his life, he says, create in me what? What? A clean heart, oh God. Create in me a clean heart. Can that be your prayer today? Do you need a clean heart? I need a clean heart. God needs to constantly be cleaning my heart out. How about you? If you need help with that, if you need prayers from this congregation, that's part of why we're here. We're here to help us have the hearts that God wants us to have so we'll live the lives that God wants us to live and obey the words that God wants us to obey. Let's pray. Oh, Father in heaven, you, the great giver of life, the creator of our hearts, you know us, Lord. You know us through and through. And you want us. You love us. We believe your word. It says, for you so loved the world, you gave your only begotten son. That whosoever believeth in him might not perish, but have everlasting life. Father, please, please create in us clean, obedient hearts. May we show it by our lives in submission to you. And when you rebuke and you chasten us, help us be humble and repentant and continue to see that you're working for our good. When things are hard in our lives, you work through those hardships for our good so we can trust in you through whatever comes, Lord. Please, please create in us clean hearts, oh God. In Jesus' name, amen. If you have any need at all, we're going to sing a song of encouragement. And if you will raise your hand, one of our elders will assist you. If you need prayer, we will pray with you and for you right here, right now. If you want to obey the gospel of Jesus Christ and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, he washes your sins away by his blood. He raises you up to walk in newness of life. He gives you his spirit and he goes with you and joins you to his family, the church. And he will carry you when you can't walk. If you will submit to him, you will be so blessed. If you need anything at all, please raise your hand as we're singing this song. Again, one of our elders will assist you and we will pray for you or whatever need you have. Break my heart, dear Lord. Tell
Again, good morning. It's good to see everyone here this morning and our visitors. We're grateful to have you here with us this morning and hope any of that are visiting with us will come at any opportunity you may have to visit with us again. A few announcements this morning and uh, following up on uh, Greg's thoughts. I appreciate your thoughts. You know, I think we can all see the flaws in, in David, but we can also see a man that was seeking God's heart, always seeking God's will. I think a lot of times we can see the flaws in ourselves, but do we have hearts of David or do we have hearts like Saul? And that's what we have to, to look in the mirror and ask ourselves those questions. Uh, I think this morning was our largest crowd. We had 133 here and upstairs, so that is great. Uh, we're getting back to some good numbers and it's good, good for that to be taking place. Remember, uh, deacons, next Sunday there will be a meeting. I know Steve said it earlier, but we're going to meet in the auditorium at 3 p.m. tomorrow, or uh, excuse me, next Sunday. And also, the elders will be here available this afternoon from 3 o'clock on. If you wish to meet with us or to talk about anything, uh, please, uh, please come by. Uh, you may give us a little jingle to make sure before you come because sometimes we are meeting with others and we don't want you to be waiting too long if you wish to come but please the door is open and we wish for you to come a few birthdays this week uh, Roy Roberts Will Ross uh, and Greg Greg meet, meeting another mouse I won't say how old you are Greg I do know how old you are you're within two years of me I won't say which side of that two years <laughs> Uh, also, next, I'll say it a little early, Louie Joe is going to have a birthday this coming week. Uh, any other announcements that we may need to announce at this time? Anyone knows? Okay, continue uh, to remember those in prayer that's been sick or struggling with health issues, especially Shay and... Uh, and the Cochran's uh, as they've recovered from the virus and also are uh, rejoicing in uh, celebrating the new birth of their daughter Oma Jane let us pray our Heavenly Father our Lord our God and our Creator what a privilege it is father together here this day in your presence father we thank you for all that you do in our lives for every expression of your love you show us through the blessings that we have especially Lord for this time that we have together here this morning enjoy the fellowship of brothers and sisters what a blessing that is and we thank you Lord for that we pray Heavenly Father that you will watch over those and heal those that have gone through uh, sickness that are going through recovery from surgeries. Uh, we pray your blessings be upon Shay and, and upon the Cochran family and, and for others, Lord. And we pray that you will be with them and heal them. And uh, we pray, Heavenly Father, that you will give each of us hearts that are desirous to seek you, Lord. Hearts that uh, not only confess you, but also, Heavenly Father, seek you daily and seek to share you daily with others. I pray, Heavenly Father, that you will continue to bless this congregation as we uh, uh, meet here on Signal Mountain. And as we are uh, beginning, or will be beginning to start uh, Sunday morning Bible classes here soon, I pray, Lord, that you will bless those efforts and, uh, and that you will be, especially with our young people, as we get back into the stage of, of teaching. And we know, Lord, that is so important. Pray, Heavenly Father, that you'll be with each one of us as we leave here this day, and especially those young people as they go back to school this coming week. And uh, for those who are teaching, I pray your hand of protection and blessing be upon them. And I pray, Heavenly Father, that you'll use, use us as your instruments and uh, that our hearts will always be soft towards you and towards others, Lord. I pray these things in Jesus' holy name. Amen. If there are any that wish to leave early that may need uh, to, to be dismissed at this time, you are welcome to go.